Coming up, it's an Android wristwatch, a solar keyboard, and a notebook that's lighter than air. It's all next on Before You Buy. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Before You Buy is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Before You Buy is brought to you by Stamps.com. Use Stamps.com to buy and print real U.S. postage the instant you need it right from your desk. To get this special offer, go to Stamps.com, click on the radio microphone, and enter Before You Buy. And by Ford, featuring the MyFord Mobile smartphone app for electric vehicles. The MyFord Mobile app makes the electric driving experience fun and efficient. Learn more about Ford electric vehicle technologies at Ford.com slash technology. Hi, welcome to Before You Buy, our product review show on the Twit Network. I'm Leo Laporte, the chief of Twit. This is the show where we get great stuff in our offices, and then we let our staff take a look at it, use it in real life, and give you their opinions of it. It's a lot of fun for everybody. And uh, every once in a while, we come across something that's particularly unusual. I did not know that Jason Howell had this. This is the WIM-1, one of a new bunch of watches designed to interface with your smartphone and uh, give you kind of a second screen. Let's see what Jason Howell of TNT thinks of the WIM-1. Hey, what's up? I'm Jason Howell, and I am here with the WIM-1 Developer Preview. It's $199 from WIM, and it's more meant for developers than it is consumers at this point. It includes the WIM-330 module, a USB charging kit, and a black watch strap. Let's take a quick look at the specs. It's a 667 megahertz Samsung ARM 11 processor with 256 megs RAM, two gigs of internal storage, upgradable to 16 gigs. It has 160 by 160 16-bit color TFT capacitive display, and it also has a transflective low-power 4-bit grayscale mode that saves battery when it's not in regular use. It's got Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, GPS, accelerometer, magnetometer, vibration, piezo speaker for alarm and notification, and they tout 30 hours of battery life when no radios are active. Finally, it's running Android 2.1, but don't let that scare you. It kind of doesn't matter with this kind of technology what version of Android it's running. So first, let's take a look at the design. It's very small. You can essentially place this anywhere you can mount it. Some examples might be a watch, a pendant, mount it on your bike. Uh, the sky's the limit, really. The display is pretty small, and the resolution is somewhat poor, especially when you compare it to some of the competition, like the Sony watch, the Moto Active, or even the Pebble concept watch at this point. Now, as for performance, once the WIM-1 companion app is installed on your phone, then it allows you to do things like syncing SMS from your phone to your watch, as well as caller ID. Very handy, and you can read that all from your watch. Uh, waking the WIM-1 from low power mode sometimes took me a few tries, but it wasn't a deal breaker. Touch sensitivity just as a whole was a little bit slow, and I'm sure that's thanks to the slower megahertz on the Samsung ARM processor. I got through a typical 12 to 16 hour day with Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, as well as brightness dialed into low, which was pretty reasonable. Now micro apps are essentially what WIM is looking for developers to create. They're managed through the WIM micro app store. You can access that through your companion app on your phone as well as the web. All apps are free currently, though WIM plans to allow developers to charge for them and keep 100% of the revenue for a limited time. Included, you're getting a watch, clock, weather, calendar, world clock, timer, alarm, and stopwatch, but you can also download others like a calculator, compass, gallery, and a number of optional watch faces. Overall, there aren't really a lot of apps currently available for the WIM-1 that would really extend the desirability of the platform. But speaking of extending the platform, developers who are interested in developing for WIM can do so for free. You can get the WIM SDK, and that includes the WIM developer platform that requires no hardware purchase. So developers can sign up for a free account, download the SDK, and follow their guidelines for creating apps tailored to the small screen. And these can be run on an included emulator, which is pretty cool. So the pros of this, uh, wearable computing, a modular approach, convenient syncing, and cons, the display is kind of poor compared to the competition, touch sensitivity is a bit slow, and the ecosystem needs more support. 
So for consumers, I'd probably recommend that you not buy the Wim one quite yet. You kind of get the feeling that maybe they're going to iterate a new version of this that might be a little bit more compelling uh, down the line in the near term. But for developers, I'd recommend that you try it for free. In fact, you can get the SDK from their site and start coding, especially if you want to try and kind of push the boundaries on something new in the Android world. You can catch my reviews on All About Android at twit.tv slash AAA. And thank you so much for checking out this review of the Wim One Developer Preview. Thank you, Jason. The, it's kind of like an Elmer Fudd name, the Wim One. That's a problem. They need a better name. I actually have ordered the Pebble Watch. That was the one that raised so much money on the Kickstarter. And um, they've made some real progress. I heard them talking about it this week at uh, Le Web. I'm hoping I'll get a Pebble Watch soon for your review on uh, Before You Buy. Stay tuned. Coming up, Nicole Lee has an update on the Samsung Galaxy S3, now available all over the U.S., but the U.S. model's a little different. She'll give us a, a description. Before we do that, though, I'd like to talk about our sponsor, Stamps.com. What a great idea. It's almost as if somebody said, gee, I really don't want to go to the post office today. Why don't I just print my stamps from my computer? It, it's exactly what you could do. Your printer, your computer, you don't need special ink, you don't need a postage meter, you just need stamps.com. Stamps.com lets you print official U.S. postage whenever you need it, exactly the right amount, because you've got a great USB scale. It, you put the letter on or the package on it, it tells you what you need. It's always up to date. You never put too much postage. You ever do that? You, you want to mail something and you got stamps and you don't know how much it weighs. You go, oh, I'm going to put extra postage just in case. That's wasting money. Stamps.com will save you money. In fact, the post office loves Stamps.com so much. They give them discounts you can't even get at the post office. 21% on express mail, 15% on priority mail. It's fantastic. This postman comes to you, mail carrier, I guess, uh, picks up the package. You can even schedule free pickups. And if you're an Amazon or eBay seller, you will love Stamps.com. The software interfaces with the websites so it automatically fills out those forms you need. Same thing for international mail. It even uses QuickBooks if you want to use it for invoices and other things. Stamps.com. Look at this $110 no-risk trial we've got for you. But you've got to do it just right. Go to Stamps.com, click the radio microphone, and use the offer code before you buy. That's all one word, before you B-U-Y. And then that $80 value turns into the $110 value, including $55 in postage coupons, that USB scale I told you about. You just pay shipping and handling for that, 5 bucks. It also includes a one-month free trial of Stamps.com. I think you'll love it. And even if you don't, just cancel and you can, you can keep the scale forever. It's yours. Stamps.com. Please try it today. Use the offer code before you buy. So the reason we were able to do this show on Twit. We wouldn't even have thought of it if it weren't for this woman right here, Nicole Lee. Come on in, Nicole. Nicole Hello. We stole Nicole away from CNET where she was reviewing smartphones. Mm -hmm. And she's the one who gets all these products into the studio and, and, uh, and, and coordinates the reviews. And, for, and when we get a really good product, like a smartphone that she's an expert on, we love to have her review it. Now, I reviewed uh, last week my uh, international unlocked version of the Samsung Galaxy S3. Mm -hmm. And I love it. But there yes. are some differences for people who will be buying it in the U.S. on AT&T, Sprint, Verizon, or T-Mobile. Yes, so this is the U.S. version. As you can see, it's pretty much identical. Is this the AT&T version? This is the AT&T version. So it's pretty much the same phone. It you feels know, the same, actually. The, yeah. the look and feel of it, the display, as you can see, is the same. 4.8-inch, you yeah. know, Super HD AMOLED. One difference is yours says AT&T AT on the back. AT&T, yeah. So Mine says Samsung on the back. It depends on which you prefer. Minor difference. <laughs> There's a bigger difference inside, though. Yes, yes. So this one has a uh, 1.5 gigahertz dual-core Qualcomm Snapdragon processor. Yours has um, a quad-core. It's a quad-core Samsung Exynos. Yes. So that's... Some people say they don't see the difference between a dual-core and a quad-core. Um, I have, have been using this for a few days. I, think, I still think it's plenty fast. Yeah, I think that one of the uh, things that's... The that points I've made in the past is mm -hmm. that... Uh, your quad core is more of a selling point on a phone. How many times are you doing more than one or two things at a time on the phone? Right. Even if you've got pr programs running in the background, right. chances are they're not actually running. They're just sleeping. Right. So dual core should be more than enough, especially 1.4 gigahertz. Yeah. No, it's 1.5. So that's pretty snappy. That's pretty it's a snappy. pretty snappy phone. It's pretty snappy. I I'm trying to scroll through your pictures, but there aren't very many on here. And they're all really tiny, so that's probably not a very good test. No, no. But look at the gallery. Look how fast. That's... That Look does that. not feel slow. That does not feel slow to no. me. Like that's still pretty speedy. Yeah. Those are all my Instagram photos. I hope you don't mind. I'm showing no, all that's your fine. pictures on there. Uh, and then of course the <laughs> screen is exactly the same. Right. Are there any other differences? 
Um, the other big difference is that the U.S. version, some U.S. phones of the Galaxy S3 has 4G LTE speeds. Now yours... Now, that's something I miss because I don't have that on mine. Has, yeah. I think tops out as like HSPA Plus. I'm using HSPA like Plus. Right. So this is AT&T. So it will work on AT&T's 4G LTE. You know, wherever, if, if you get it. Which we don't hear, which, which was why I didn't it. mind. Right. So, and that, you know, the speed of the AT&T network can vary from city to city. Um, I've seen reports from like around 15 megabits per second, which is Now, you live nice. in San Francisco. What were you getting in San Francisco? It was around, um, about, about 50 is about right. That's pretty good. That's pretty That's good. That's better than That's most people's uh, home internet connection. Right, but it, it goes up and down depending on right. where I am in the city. So, you know, it depends now, on where you live. Now, does this come with Flipboard, like uh, my international yes, phone? Yes, it does. That's it comes nice. with Flipboard. It comes with a whole slew of apps. I mean, that's the other thing I should say is that it does come with some carrier bloatware. Um, so Sprint comes with like, you know, all the Sprint stuff at right. NASCAR, Sprint. Some people might not mind that if you're into NASCAR, there's nothing AT &T's, wrong with that. AT&T's, you know, weather app, AT&T's right. navigation app. Right. Uh, one, no, the, sort of the, the downside of having bloatware on your um, phone. There is something it doesn't come with, and I got this wrong now. Last week, I think I said that Dropbox, which offers internationally 50 gigabytes for two years for free, right. that offer, which I got on my Samsung Galaxy S, in fact, I already have a Dropbox account, and it automatically added it to my existing Dropbox account, that is not being offered by AT&T, I know, and is it Verizon that doesn't offer it? AT&T and Verizon are okay. not including Dropbox. But Sprint, Sprint yes. will, and that was my mistake last week. T-Mobile as well, I believe. So, I believe. so if, if that's important to you, and you know, it's only a two they're only charging 200 which is nice because yes. the Note is 300 the Nexus was 300 yes. So they, they aren't trying to gouge you on the price of the phone initially. Right. And if you think that you're getting an extra two years of 50 gigabytes of Dropbox, that's good. That cuts the price a little bit more. It makes it a little bit more affordable. But you won't be getting that again on Verizon and right. AT&T. Also to note is that T-Mobile is kind of the last, the sort of the worst of the lot, I feel, because... Well, it doesn't have LTE. It doesn't have LTE. Thing. It talks about HSPA Plus, and yeah. the phones are more expensive. Because, but the, the, doubt, the, good, the, the good part of that is that they're charging you less over time because the phones are not, are not as subsidized. Right, right. So it does cost like $30 more, depending on which phone you're getting. But I think it's as good as your international version. Um, I do want to mention something called Tectiles. This is, I didn't However, know about this because it wasn't <laughs> announced until after it came out in the U.S. Yes, so it was this, coincided with the launch. This has always had in, in it, and uh, I think I did mention this, in the Samsung battery, it's one of the reasons you're going to want to get a Samsung battery if you get an extra battery, there is an NAC chip NFC. in there. Near field communication. Yes. That means if you're near an NSA, NFC receiver... Or sender, I'm not sure how it works, but you could tap this phone on right. it, and the phone will recognize it. So tech tiles are NFC chips. Let's it's see this. It's a little this. NFC sticker. They're, they're kind of chips. expensive. They're three bucks each. Yeah, they're pricey. They send them and sell them in packs of five. Uh, so if I peel this off and I glue this, let's say to, to my table, dashboard yeah, or wherever, a table, a wall or something, and then I put the tech tile software on the phone, which I have. So let's, shall I launch it? Sure. Shall I tap no, it? You don't have to launch, launch any software. No software launch. Just need it. No, just tap it. I just it. tap this just on tap this? Just tap the back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just tap on the back. seem right. Okay, well, and it's, then it's going to recognize it. Well, the, the, it's, it's currently locked, so let me just swipe unlock it to unlock it. it. Shall and, I tap uh, it again? Yeah, okay. just tap it. Oh, it did. It went bloop, bloop. It set the alarm to 8 a.m. because that's what I set the tactile to do. I oh, how interesting. I programmed it. So you can the program the, each of these to yes, do something different. You can There's five it. of them. Like one of these goes to the TV site. Oh, let's try uh, it. Let's try oh, you are wanna... so you are so clever. So you actually have to physically it touch it. Immediately, it launched through the TV. Yep. Immediately, yep. I didn't have to do. The browser wasn't even launched. I didn't have to do that. It was immediate. It immediately went to it and went blank. Yes. Okay. And what? And okay. What one, else? This is fun. Four square check in to the brick house. Oh, I want to check in. Look at that. So I could put this on my desk and it would automatically. No, wait a minute. It's doing something else. Yeah, I think something happened. <laughs> no, this was the empty tag. Oh, sorry. I've We've very, lost the four square. I've lost it. the four square tag. It doesn't, I get the idea. You don't. Have, don't worry about it. So that's okay, a tag you, you that's get, not you been programmed. Um, yeah. So you, what's the programming process? You launch the Tectile <laughs> right. app. You touch it and you say, "Here's what I want to have happen." Right. Can almost anything? It's, I'm amazed. You can set alarms. It sounds like almost. You can anything set can. alarms. You can send text messages. So pre-programmed text messages, for example, you can do a Foursquare check-in. You can send tweets. Like for some reason, you want to send automated tweets. You can do that. But do note um, that you have to have an, the official Samsung Galaxy battery in here. That's where the NFC chip is in this yes, phone. Yes. So I often buy extra batteries, but sometimes I'll buy third-party batteries. That would be a bad idea in this case. Mm -hmm. I'd lose that feature. Right. And these are not cheap. I think it's ridiculous no, to charge three dollars each. Yeah. For a pack of five, it's fifteen bucks. They, they sell them in a pack of five. 
and that's yeah. You have to buy a five pack. Nevertheless, kind of cool. I'm going to put kinda one cool. on the, the dashboard of my car, maybe one at home, <laughs> one on my desk, so I could check in. That's kind of fun. I, I, it's I like kinda fun. that. Idea. I do have to say that um, Samsung has Oops, said that, that this this will work on um, other Samsung phones, not just the oh. not just the anything um, with S3, NFC. But there are some functions that are sort of like, for example, when it, if it's if it's very advanced features like the four square check in, that that might be more of Samsung's. Uh, uh, arena. For example, if it's the Galaxy Nexus, which is not a Samsung phone, even though it's made by Samsung, it's a Google experience phone. Right. It's not a Samsung experience phone. But it does phone. have NFC. But it does have NFC, but it won't do those more advanced... It won't do all of the things yes. that the, so uh, this phone will do. It kind of depends on You know on what? what phone why would you buy... Okay, let me ask you, because you <laughs> reviewed the HTC One, did yeah. you not? Mm -hmm. And really, if you ask me, there are two top-of-the-line Android phones, this and, and the, the One uh, HTC One yeah. X. So of the two, which do you like better? Oh, it's Sophie's choice. Um, well, what are the pros and cons? I mean... <laughs> right. I have to say the One X, I, be, I prefer the camera on the One X. Camera's better. Okay. Yeah, so that to some people may be the tipping point. Now, one of the things I like about the Galaxy S3 is mm -hmm. removable battery. You, you can't do that you on HTC One. You can't do that on the One X. And, and I, as I said, I like to have extra batteries because none of these phones last more than, say, 10 yeah. hours on yeah. a single charge. So um, it depends what's important to you, I guess. I actually... I kind of prefer the S3 just because I the I prefer the interface. I and love the screen. It is a better the screen. The screen is way better than the One yeah. X, I feel. And it is, it, they don't call it a retina display, but it's very close to the resolution of the iPhone mm. 1280 by 720. I am st standing by this. You know, I, a week after I did my review, I still only carry this. I actually put the <laughs> iPhone aside, which is too bad because I can no longer log into Diablo 3s to show you that later. Right. But <laughs> but I love this phone. Wait a minute. Is this yours? Oh, or is I, this? Uh, hmm, uh, well, I'll just, okay. we'll figure it out later. <laughs> no. Thank I you, Nicole Lee. And the Galaxy S3 US edition. Yes. That's the differences. That's a clarification yes. on it. Um, yeah, it's this is a sweet phone, and I'm gonna. Are you gonna? Okay, you can. You can. You can. Now every time. <laughs> now you'll know why I'm checking into Nicole's uh, office all the time. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> can I reprogram these? Yeah, absolutely. No, you just, can have. Are just, you gonna keep the phone? Um, just you, you can you can download the tactile app, which is free. Yeah, but are you gonna keep the phone? So if you are, you should keep these. Sure, I will do that. Sorry. Thank you, Nicole <laughs> Lee, for that fine review of the Galaxy S3. I really appreciate it. Um, it, you know, it confirms what I've been thinking, which is this is an excellent phone. And even with some of the limitations in the uh, U.S. market, it's uh, still a fan, it's a fabulous phone. $200 for the 16 gig on AT&T, uh, Verizon, and Sprint. $230 on T-Mobile, but as Nicole said, a lower monthly fee. Uh, $280 T-Mobile for the 32 gig, um, and it's uh, $250 for the 32 gig uh, on uh, the other three carriers. I don't think you need 32 gigs. This is a phone that you could put an SD card in. Uh, 16 gigs has been more than enough for me, and I run more apps than the average Joe. And uh, if you want music and photos and additional space, you could put 32 gigs in the SD card. Save your money. Get the 16 gig version. I think that's fine. Uh, all right. It's going to be uh, time for um, our short reviews in just a second. We've got a, a, a quickie from Colin Weir. He's going to review a solar keyboard from Logitech. Uh, for the uh, not for the iPad, it, wait a minute, it is for the iPad, but it doesn't charge the iPad. It just charges the keyboard. Colin will explain. Colin, hey guys, this is Colin for Twit, and today we are taking a look at the Logitech Solar Keyboard Folio. This is a folio style keyboard case for your iPad. It works with the iPad 2 or 3, and it's got a couple gimmicks built in. So the first gimmick is this set of solar panels on the back. Now these don't charge your iPad, but they do charge the keyboard. Now Logitech claims that as little as six hours of room light a day will give you two years of usage. Unfortunately, I don't have the kind of time to test that, so we're gonna have to take their word for it. But I've been using it casually on and off for the past few days, and I haven't had any battery issues with the case. In addition to the solar powered gimmick, this keyboard also has a few tricks up its sleeve. It uses these standard magnets to wake and sleep it, and then it comes with two modes you can position it in. If you position it like this, the first thing that you will get is keyboard mode. So in this mode, you get your standard keyboard, and you can type on it just like this. 
The keyboard is a little cramped and it will probably take some getting used to, but overall it's not a bad typing experience and the keys have about the same feel as the standard Apple keyboard. Now the other trick that this keyboard has is media mode and what that is is if you slide it forward into these grooves it gives you a nice media player. It's a good angle for watching videos and it also turns the bottom row of keys into media control keys. You can start and stop your music, you can go back and you can advance and you can adjust the volume just by using the keyboard and without having to hit a function button. So the two pros of this device the solar power really does work, and as long as you get about six hours of room light a day, you'll never have to think about charging a battery. And the other pro is that the media mode really is nice for watching movies, especially on something like an airplane tray. The cons, well, it's pretty thick. It's going to add a lot of bulk to your iPad just for this feature. And the other big con is the $130 price point, and that's just not worth it in my opinion because charging a keyboard battery isn't that much of an inconvenience, at least not to the point that I'm willing to spend $130 over, say, a $40 case just for that solar-powered gimmick. And because of that high price point, I'm going to put the Logitech Solar Keyboard Folio square in the don't buy category. Uh, I don't blame Colin. First of all, $130 uh, for the Logitech Solar Keyboard Folio. And I got to point out, you know, they make another $100 keyboard, which I reviewed and love, or we've reviewed on the show, and I love the Logitech Ultra Thin iPad cover, which, frankly, is less clunky than this, is just the same keyboard. And they say it will last six months on a charge. So he needs solar. That's, that's crazy talk. Uh, I guess it's cool for the solar, but that's about it. Um, all right. Let's pause for a moment, and then I'm going to come back and review my new baby, Yes, the iPad, I'm sorry, the MacBook Pro Retina display. It is a, similar to the iPad display, and it is something else, but we'll talk about it in a second. First, let me talk a little bit about my favorite car company. You know who I'm talking about. They're going by all the time. And can you see my Mustang's out there somewhere with the Ford Sync? I'm talking about Ford Motor Company. I went down to uh, the Computer History Museum on uh, Monday and talked with the CTO of Ford, Paul Macarenas, really nice guy, and Prasad, who is an engineer I've talked to before, really brilliant guy, who is now going to be the director, is going to run the new Silicon Valley office of Ford. Why are they offering, operating an office in, in Silicon Valley? Prasad explained it to me. He said, we really see the car as a platform, just as an operating system might be a platform or a Google Docs might be a platform, a platform that you can build upon. He says, we realize you're going to have that car for years. Technology is going to advance in the time that you own that car. So what we do is we build into the car all the capabilities, the sensors, the information, the interface, the computer, and then we go to Silicon Valley developers and say, here's the platform. Would you like to develop for it? And of course... They've already developed numbers of apps with the AppLink API interface. And Ford themselves has an app. It's called the My Ford Mobile app. And it's designed specifically for the brand new 2012 Ford Focus Electric. What a cool idea. You can control the charging on your car in the garage from the living room on your BlackBerry iPhone or Android phone. You can tell the car, I'm going to leave at 8.30 tomorrow morning. Make sure it's 72 degrees in the cabin or uh, heat it or cool it to get it ready while it's plugged in to save juice while you hit the road. You could tell the, uh, the phone can tell the car, hey, let's take the most eco-friendly route or here's where a plug-in uh, station is, a charging station for you. There are, is also a MyFord Mobile a website and a forum where you can get tips for eco-friendly driving and get on the leaderboards for the most CO2 saved. Look, I've talked a lot about this 2012 Ford Focus Electric. It's an amazing vehicle. And now the My Ford mobile app it just makes a lot of sense. Add capabilities on top of this brilliant platform uh, to do all sorts of really cool things. I invite you to drive one at an EV certified Ford dealer near you or visit the website Ford.com slash technology. You can learn all about the electric and, of course, next year's 2013. And they had one there, and I am loving this platform. The Fusion Energy plug-in hybrid, really slick, also works with the MyFord mobile app. 
Ford.com slash technology. Drive one today. All right. Talking about driving one, I got to drive this brand new laptop computer. This is, and we heard the announcement about a week and a half ago at the Worldwide Developers Conference, the MacBook Pro with Retina display. And I've been calling it the MacBook Elite. An elite price, but also an elite form factor that uh, some people will say is the best MacBook ever. That's what Apple's calling it. Is it? In short, yes. But there are definitely trade-offs. First of all, look how thin it is. It's only slightly thinner than the MacBook Air. It is a lot heavier, a pound and a half heavier. So some people are going to say, well, that's a little too heavy for me to carry. Uh, it's a big screen. That's a 15.4-inch screen. We'll talk about that more in a, late, in a little bit. Uh, they have different connectors on this, and that's one of the big changes here. Uh, two Thunderbolt ports. That's kind of overkill. I'm not sure why you have two Thunderbolt ports on it. They've now got USB 3 because this is based on the Ivy Bridge platform from Intel, which kind of gives you USB 3 for free. I've ordered a USB flash drive, and I'll give you a report on how fast it is. Apparently, with USB 3, we're going to be able to read at 220 megabytes a second. I mean, it is noticeably, appreciably, lots faster if you get the drive that has the speed. On the other side, another USB 3 connector. And wait a minute, what's that? That's an HDMI port. Now, we really never missed HDMI on the MacBooks with Thunderbolt because Thunderbolt's easily converted. This, this is a mini display port. You can buy an inexpensive adapter that turns it into HDMI. We use those all the time around the studio. They're reliable. They're cheap. They're easy to use. So I'm not really sure why they felt the need to put an HDMI port on it, but it'll certainly be welcome for anybody who wants to connect this to a TV. It works great. We plug in our, uh, we plug in our HDMI adapters here. The MacBook instantly sensed it instantly set the resolution to an appropriate scale and uh, it worked just flawlessly and without any configuration on our part. I do appreciate that. Of course, finally, you'll see an SD card slot here, which Apple has included on all of its MacBook uh, Pros lately. Uh, the keyboard is very similar, uh, backlit keyboard. They have a great, the great Apple trackpad, the best in class with this glass trackpad. Uh, but the screen is, of course, what's getting all the attention. This is a very high resolution screen. It's native resolution. And I say that carefully because you're not going to be using its native resolution most of the time. Its native resolution is double the old 15.4 inch MacBook Pro. It's 2880 across uh, by 1800 top to bottom. It is a very high-resolution display, the highest-resolution display I've ever seen uh, in this size of a screen. If I set this screen to that native resolution, though, menus are too tiny to use, windows are so small, icons are so small, and you can't read the text. So this display, if you use Apple's Best for Retina setting, will always be, get ready for this, 1440 by 900. What, you might say? Well, because it's got so many extra pixels, it's using sub-pixel rendering, aliasing to make text look super crisp, and I'll show you the text looks fantastic on this. And in applications written by Apple and soon by other companies to take advantage of the Retina display, when it needs the additional resolution, it can use it. As an example, uh, Aperture will use the higher resolution. This is VLC, and it's giving me this... I'm going to show you a movie. In fact, let me show you right now. This is a fantastic... Uh, movie that was shot in 4K. This is a 1620p version of Timescapes that the developers sent to me. And the resolution on this, the crispness on this, you're probably not seeing it at home because you're only seeing it at best at 720p. Believe me, you've never seen anything look so good. It looks like you're looking through a window. Hear how good that music sounds? They have updated the speakers. They're not super loud, but the quality is noticeably better. Very good for a notebook. You know, if you really want high fidelity, you're still going to attach speakers to the MacBook Pro with Retina. Uh, initially, Apple has updated its apps, uh, Safari, Aperture, iPhoto, iMovie, to take advantage of this incredible display. Uh, and I've already seen some other apps be updated. There are a number of apps. Chrome today came out in the developer channel with an updated Chrome that looks fantastic. Most of the time, though, if you're not using that updated Chrome, you'll want to use Safari as your browser. Otherwise, sites don't look very good. And it's interesting, there's some applications like Twitter that just look terrible. And the reason is Twitter, uh, for an example, in order to make scrolling faster, doesn't use the native text rendering uh, libraries 
in the Macintosh, the WebKit libraries, it actually pre-renders the text and then kind of displays it as, a, as an image so it scrolls faster. That turns out to have been a bad strategy when we get to the retina display. I'm sure, in fact, I think Twitter's already said they'll be updating that application. Meanwhile, applications that do use WebKit will already take advantage. Uh, I mean, this, the text on this, I have to show you, is spectacular. If you're doing any reading at all, uh, you will be very happy. Let's go to a slash dot, uh, which is a very text-heavy site, and show you how great it uh, it looks. Um, well, you may not you may not really be able to tell, but uh, believe me, now that I've been reading text on this screen, I can't go back to anything. The Retina display on the Apple or the iPhone, or maybe my Samsung Galaxy S. Here, I'll, I'll dim it a little bit so you can see a little bit better. It's it's just so good. You'll see it immediately when you open up the computer. The icons look so great on the dock. Everything is crisper and much, much more legible. It, it really, unfortunately, there's no point in, in, in getting closer to your screen, though, folks, because you're just not going to see it at home. You have to go to an Apple store to take a look. Uh, battery life on this has been pretty good. It charges fast. They did change the MagSafe adapter, so if you order this, you're going to want to get a $10 MagSafe adapter adapter so you can use it with your other power supplies. Uh, unaccountably, they now have the MagSafe adapter sticking back out as, as it used to instead of the nice slim form factor that they have on the MacBook Airs. I'm not sure why they did that. They're I don't think there's any technical reason for that. There's one other thing people might have noticed and are very upset about. There's no Ether port on this. So if you work somewhere where there's no Wi-Fi or you need Ethernet when you travel around, you're either going to want to buy the additional Ethernet adapter that plugs into the USB 3 or you're just not going to want to buy this computer. There are compromises in its design. However, there are no compromises in the SSD. It's very fast and the Retina display, it's gorgeous. I am very happy with it. It's thin, it's light, and it is absolutely, uh, in my opinion, the best MacBook ever. Twenty-one ninety-nine for the base unit. The base unit comes pretty well equipped with an eight gigabyte RAM and two hundred fifty-six gigabyte SSD, uh, an i7 four core quad core uh, i7 uh, running at I think two point three gigahertz. Although. Uh, of course, as needed, it can speed up to even faster than 3 gigahertz. I found this machine to be the fastest Mac I've ever used, partly because of the SSD, partly because of the quad-core i7. Faster even than my Xeon Mac Pro at home. And if, by the way, I know people want to know, yes, it plays Diablo beautifully, even at the highest resolution. Just spectacular. It looks great. It feels great. I, I like carrying it around. A little bit heavier than a MacBook Air, but, boy, you sure get a whole lot more. Would I buy this? Well, let me give you the pros and cons first. The pros, the great display, the very high speed, the gorgeous looks, the ultra-slim profile. The cons, no Ethernet port. Uh, it, it, uh, it, it is not upgradable or repairable in any way. They've glued all the parts in here. In fact, it is pricey. That's the third con, and you're going to have to, I think, buy the $350 Apple Care when you buy this. So add another $350 to the cost, making it $25.50 plus tax, because you cannot service this. You're going to have to bring it back to Apple. They say 1,000 charges on the battery, but after that, it's $200 to replace the battery, and only Apple can do it. Pentalobe screws, glued-in parts. Even the screen is glued together. There's no glass in the front. Um, that's a little disappointing. It means it's not repairable. That's a con. But overall, absolutely strong buy recommendation. If you can afford it and you want the top of the line, this absolutely is uh, a MacBook Pro Elite, the new MacBook Pro with Retina display. Just a gorgeous work of art. And I think a harbinger of things to come from Apple. Well, that does it for Before You Buy. I thank you so much for being here. We thank Jason Howell uh, for his review. We thank Colin Weir, our streaming engineer, for his review. And, of course, the great Nicole Lee for producing the show and giving us an update on the Galaxy 3 from Samsung. Thank you for being here. You can email us at byb at twit.tv. We make full versions of all of our reviews available on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash twit. Uh, I'm Leo Laporte. Thanks for being here, and I'll see you next week. Remember, you got to watch before you buy. See you later. <laughs>